let me introduce the first speaker of this conference, Richard Lawrence. Richard Lawrence. Professor Lawrence is the Executive Secretary of the Ontario Society for Europe and has devoted his life to the work of his master and personal friend, the late Dr. George King, who died in 1997. King was also the founder of the Ontario Society. He also co-authored the last book by Dr. King to be published in his lifetime, Contacts with God from Space. Richard is the award-winning international author of a dozen books translated into ten languages and has taken part in hundreds of radio shows around the world, including several appearances on Coast to Coast. During his lecture here at the conference, we hope he also will dispel some of the myths and misconceptions regarding the late George King and his work. We are all really looking forward to hear what Richard has to say. A great welcome to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you, Terry. Good at a mittag. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Terry, for inviting me to speak here and the Ethereum Society to come here. Please to say Alison, my wife has come over. Also a wonderful couple from the north of England, David and Elizabeth Trimble are here, and you'll meet them I'm sure. And also with us is Henrik on the camera there, who's actually from Hollywood, but originally he's from Norway, so that's fantastic. <laughs> so, great. And uh, it's, I'm particularly pleased and honored that we're opening this uh, International UFO Conference with a talk on Dr. George King, Cosmic Avatar. And there isn't a subject that I personally would rather speak about. Uh, it's very, very close to my heart because he was, is and was very, very close to my heart. Uh, Dr. George King, I believe, is one of the greatest uh, cosmic avatars ever to come to this Earth. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Before I do, may I say that uh, I was also very pleased. It's the first time that we've come over to Norway, Alison and myself. And I'm a tremendous lover, I would like, just like to say, if I may hear, of the composer Grieg, Edvard Grieg. And I think Edvard Grieg uh, accomplished a fantastic feat. Apart from his musical genius, he was also uh, an extremely cultured, civilized, well-behaved, spiritual gentleman. And that, among musical geniuses, is very rare. <laughs> in fact, among artistic geniuses in general, it's very rare and quite an accomplishment and quite a feat. But anyway, I'm here to talk about Dr. King, who I knew well, just so to give you a little background on where I'm coming from. Um, I came across him when I was at university in England uh, and I knew him from a distance. I certainly didn't know him well at that time. I did meet him, ran some errands for him at times and got to know him later. But from about, I would say, the last 20 years of his life, I was in touch with him every single day on average. I was either on the phone to him every day or I was with him either in England or in America or in Scotland and got to know him very, very well indeed, and was not only a, a disciple of his, which I am and was, but also a very close friend as well. Um, and of course of his wife, his dear wife Monique, who's still with us, I'm very pleased to say, who uh, was also an extremely close disciple, of course, of his. Uh, he was the most unusual person. I think when you're looking at the life's work and the claims, and there's no question the claims that Dr. George King made and that the Ethereum Society makes are very radical ones. Uh, if we think it's difficult now dealing with the media, uh, I'm sure you can, we can only imagine what it was like in 1950s England, very conservative time in England just after the war, uh, for somebody to come out and declare in public that they were, in fact, in touch with beings from other planets, which Dr. King did, and was mercilessly ridiculed for. It wasn't just a little smile, it was merciless ridiculing in the mainstream press. 
and uh, to, to correct any wrong impression straight away, he did not make any money from it at all much. I mean, he, he lived in a very modest way indeed, I know that. There are clichés, of course, there are very easy, very lazy clichés, which is quite easy for the media to adopt, uh, such as calling the Aetherosite a cult, for example, and calling him a cult leader. It's a very easy thing to do. And of course, as soon as you say the word cult, you've got all the very nasty inferences that certain cults, shall we say, who, who are indeed, um, from what I can tell, I'm not an expert on it, uh, performing unsavory practices. And of course, you get uh, association, and then people think, "Oh well, then you know they're all the same," and this type of thing. Um, and it's it's completely wrong. Um, it's not true of the Aetherius Society. I'm afraid it is true, from what I can tell, of certain other organisations. Uh, and it's a very easy and lazy label that the media can put up on you. I must say, even in my time, talking of uh, Terry's introduction. In, the, uh, you, in my time in the UFO movement, I've seen a massive change. That's, that's not going back to the 1950s when Dr. King started and when Dr. King talked in public about government cover-ups in the 1950s. I mean, he ran, if, you've ever, if you know London at all, it's a place there called Trafalgar Square, a big square in, in central London. He ran um, a... Uh, a campaign in that square, a petition in that square, in 1958 for the British government to reveal the truth and stop lying about flying saucers. We can imagine how that went down in the 1950s. I remember in the 19, early 1980s on the platform and in the media, I've done a lot of broadcasting, uh, had a, a radio show myself at one point with a, uh, a, a DJ in London, on a big channel, I've had a lot of experience with that, and I do remember the time when if you went on a stage, or some of you might remember this, or you went on the media and you said the governments are lying about anything, you were regarded as eccentric. If I went on now, if I came out here and said, I think governments are all telling the truth, you'd think I was a raving madman. <laughs> The world has changed. Young people know, don't look at it that way at all. But there was still a time when just to say there's a cover-up was regarded as nutty, eccentric, weird. Uh, now, of course, we, we, have, we know that the various governments have lied not only about flying saucers, they've definitely lied about that, but about a whole range of other things too. And, you know, we live in an era where we find big corporations are lying. And, but people are much less naive than they used to be, I think. But you still can get ridicule, yes. You can, it's an easy, another easy way of going by people who don't really want to address the issues. Well, we're, I want to now address uh, from my experience, my personal experience, and what I've learned, uh, the true facts about Dr. George King and present them to you. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. You can investigate it if you wish. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'll be going into more depth into the teachings, the missions that he performed and which are being performed now uh, in direct cooperation with beings from other planets. Um, but today, I want to focus not so much on the teachings and the missions, but on the person, the personality, the man, the master himself, Dr. George King. And I do think... Um, those are the two ways, really, to, to, to investigate or check anything out. One is to look at the, what is said, see what you think of what is said, see what you think of the communications which are claimed, see what you think of the missions which are performed, the deeds, the actions which are done. And the other is to look at the source. And this afternoon, it's a real pleasure to be looking at that source, Dr. George King. So let me just tell you a little bit, a little bit about who he was, where he came from, and how it all started. But before I do, I must define what I mean by a cosmic avatar. Cosmic avatar is a phrase which means a being, a divine being, if you like, a, a spiritual being, a godlike being, if you like, from another planet who's come to Earth. And of course, history is absolutely full of such examples. Um, I'm not going to say there are many, many um, cosmic avatars then or even now, but there are a number of them. 
and we form our own conclusions about them. And we are looking, let's, so we're in the western part of the world, let's name one, let's start off with a real controversy, the Master Jesus, um, who I, I believe did not come uh, to earth as the one and only Son of God, but was in fact a being from another world, a God for sure, not the one and only Son of God, but a God-like being. Others would be Sri Krishna, and he was described in, in Hindu writings, is described as an avatar, which means a divine incarnation. Others would include the Lord Buddha, would include Confucius and Lao Tse, would include Moses, would include a, a number of great spiritual beings. Not every spiritual person in history has come from another planet. Thank goodness, so there are some terrestrial spiritual giants, uh, but some of the greatest have come to earth. And they've come to earth, uh, I believe, and been incarnated uh, through birth, through the womb of a, of a woman on earth. Hercules, by the way, would be another, who also is described as the son of God, or the son of Zeus, as they would have said in ancient Greece. Um, and Samson uh, was, a, was a product of a a virtually, not quite a virgin birth, but his mother was incapable of, of, of producing children and then an angel appeared. There are stories of all kinds, Sri Patanjali, Sri Sankacharya. These are some of the cosmic avatars who visited our world, who've been born upon Earth through the womb of an Earth woman, generally speaking, and then have performed a mission. And in doing so, they've taken terrible karma. Let, let me just sort of look at it, what would be very, very good would be to try to look at it from their point of view, I feel. Very, very often I think people of various spiritual traditions tend to look upon it in a somewhat selfish manner. I mean, I've heard Christians calling for Jesus to come back to earth again. My goodness, wasn't it bad enough the last time? <laughs> Why would we wish that upon such a being as that? Um, let's look at it from their point of view. They, these are um, highly advanced, I believe, and this is where a new revelation has been made by Dr. King, to the best of my knowledge. I don't know, I'm not, I know there are a number of people nowadays who do believe in incarnations from other planets, for certain. But I don't know of another person before him who put it down in the way that he did, um, that these are highly evolved interplanetary beings, I've named some of them, who have agreed to be born in the most primitive, the most squalid of conditions on an extremely backward planet. I, you know, it makes me laugh when I, and I, you know, sometimes when I go on an interview uh, in the media and they get on, inverted commas, an expert, um, and that expert is possibly an astronomer, who's then brought on as an expert on extraterrestrial life. Well, that depends on his telescope, I suppose, or her telescope. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, and then, they, then sometimes they'll make a statement something like this. There might be, somewhere out there in space, life as advanced as us. <laughs> as advanced as us? Is that difficult? Um, no, the, it's the other way around. We are lagging behind. This is a planet, well, I don't have to tell you here. I mean, you know, we have a thing called war. They don't have war, I believe, on, on the advanced planets in this solar system. And of course, there are planets beyond this solar system. Let me just be clear here. From the beginning, Dr. King, uh, when he first went out into the media in about 1955, I suppose, roughly, was clear that when he's talking about life on Mars, on Venus, on Jupiter, on Saturn, he's talking about higher life, higher spiritual life that may or may not be visible at all to us. That was his contention from the beginning, just as there is higher life on this earth that isn't visible to most people unless they're in a very clairvoyant state or unless they're capable of controlled astral projection and can travel to a higher realm, and I'm sorry to say, lower realm. If, that, if you can imagine such a thing, there are lower realms than this one as well, I believe. 
wrongly called the hells. Uh, that's not quite an accurate description, although it's a very, it is in some ways a very accurate description. Um, now, this earth is extremely backward, extremely primitive, uh, very conditioned indeed. You probably experienced that, I'm guessing, just by the reaction you might get, the conditioned reaction you might get from even very good, nice people, might even be some family members or good friends, when you so much as mention extraterrestrial life and some of the implications of it. They don't know that there's no such life. I, I will say though, I did do, since I've criticised the media a bit, I did do an interview with the Astronomer Royal in Britain, that man called Lord Rees, and in that interview he amazed me, because he said and a few years ago, we should open our minds to the possibility of life on Mars, on Venus, on Jupiter, on Saturn. I almost fell off my seat. I, I said to him, well, what about the sun? He said, I'm not sure about the sun. So there we, uh, you know, we parted company on that one. But up to that, that's a tremendous change. I'll be talking more about that tomorrow in morning, contacts with the gods from space about higher dimensional life and so on. But that's the life that Dr. King was talking about. That's the, the place. It's not just a physical place, it's a spiritual place. It's a high cultured civilization um, of love, of wisdom, of total conformity with spiritual law, or if you like, karmic law, that these beings come from when they come down and agree to be born on this earth it, through the womb of an earth woman in a very backward, very conditioned, and sometimes extremely hostile environment. And I think we should look at that from their point of view. If we think of what, how we would feel to suddenly be incarnated as a pig, living in a pig's sty, among other pigs, to help the pigs, um, although the pigs don't go to war, I'll, give the, I'll, I'll say that for them, but <laughs> to help the pigs, then I think we might get some idea of the tremendous sacrifice tremendous sacrifice these wonderful beings have made, and in the case of Dr. King made. Now, just so I'm clear here, Dr. King never revealed in public um, to, the, to this fact, to the best of my knowledge, or hardly ever that I know of anyway. He, he kept it very much to himself, his origins. He didn't focus on himself in terms of his teaching. He focused on the teachings that he received uh, as, as a channel, as primary terrestrial mental channel, and the missions he performed. Uh, but in fact, he himself was one of those. Um, this is something that was revealed to a certain number of people, and now it's quite fine to reveal it. Uh, some cosmic avatars don't necessarily know uh, that they are from other planets, certainly immediately. That revelation can, can come later. In his particular case, I think it came somewhere, I believe, in the late 1950s, somewhere in that period, he became clear to him exactly where he came from and still didn't reveal it, still didn't focus on that, didn't focus on himself, actually, as a source, focused on other beings, rather people focused, say, on the Master Jesus, who channeled through him, than focus on him. But as the decades went by, it became apparent to anyone who knew him, anyone who observed him or studied his teaching and his life and his work, just what an outstanding master he really was. Now he was born in, uh, in England in, near, in Shropshire, a county in the West Country, in, in a place near Wellington on January the 23rd, 1919. Actually the place he was born is called Lealshaw and it was a little kind of a village uh, he was born in, in, the, in the house in those days, not in a hospital. And um, some very, very significant words were spoken by someone who was to become his favourite relative, uh, his grandmother, his mother's mother, uh, at the moment of his birth. She was a well-known, by the way, psychic and medium in her own right in the north of England, North Yorkshire, but she was down there staying and she said, My God, Mary, this child is not of this earth. Um, and indeed, that was correct, correct statement. Um, now, I can't obviously go through his whole life, otherwise we wouldn't even, we wouldn't get very far because there's so much detail. I just want to highlight 
two or three things from his early life. Uh, he was a sickly child quite often. He did not have good health, I should say. Um, he had a hardy upbringing. What sort of person was he? I think that's interesting to know. He was uh, what it was called in England anyway, a scrapping lad, a person who did like, uh, you know, what schoolboys like doing. He was particularly attracted, and this I think is very interesting fact, to martial skills. By martial skills, I mean things like boxing, uh, fencing, uh, marksmanship in sport, a thing uh, called quarter, mast, quarter uh, staff, which is a staff, I imagine it happened here in Norway in medieval days too. And of course, being England, they were still doing it in the 1920s and 30s. And he was doing this. These are martial skills. So he was attracted to those, but he was also very attracted to spirituality above all else from a very early age indeed. And he was a strange combination of someone who in some ways was a born fighter because he was always willing to take on, despite the fact later he was mercilessly ridiculed in the press, uh, it didn't stop him at all. It didn't deter him at all. And he had that fighting spirit, but at the same time, he was um, a pacifist. He was not a believer in his war. And his family actually had Quaker, well, non-conformist, um, background. His father had been a, a non-combatant in the First World War in, in the ambulance services and that tradition was there in, in him and it was deeply rooted in him. It's a very strange combination, a very unusual combination in one persona to have fighting skills, not be a fearful person at all and yet be inclined towards pacifism because the wars uh, on this earth are not fought according to spiritual law. Let's face it, in any sense at all. And the existence of them is generally not according to spiritual law. Um, and certainly the way they're conducted is generally not according to spiritual law. Uh, but, the, you know, he was, as I say, uh, a combative person. A person who was willing to fight and who later on was to fight spiritual battles. Um, for the betterment of others, including any opponents who had um, the wish to fight against truth, fight against spirituality, um, not only on this realm, but on others too. At the age of 11, he had a most extraordinary experience, which was to heal his mother, but not heal her um, hand with his hands laid upon her. He went into the woods in a place called Hutton Gate, in the north of England, and there he had his first cosmic encounter uh, with a being, which he, those days he described or thought was an angel, being that was illuminated from within, appeared to him, and he sent healing to his mother, and indeed his mother was cured of an illness she'd had for some time. Um, he had unusual experiences, he went to a school uh, in, in uh, probably a place not um, very different from, say, Le uh, Levanga up the road or some of these local towns here, a small country town called Gisborough in North Yorkshire. And he went to the grammar school there and he was, a, according to reports, a very good student indeed um, and engaged in, in everything. But he had a, a formative experience when he was aged 14 or 15 um, of demonstrating incredible physical strength. I'm just picking out one or two incidents here from his life. So um, marked was this demonstration of physical strength, his ability to bend a steel tube which was unbendable, um, that it shocked everybody and shocked his headmaster. He was asked not to even come into school they didn't know what to do in a country school like this. He, he didn't understand it in those days. He later on did understand it as being a manifestation of Kundalini. He became an absolute expert later in Kundalini yoga. That's a fascinating subject. One of my favorite subjects, the advanced yogas. One which, um, if you're interested in it, uh, when we have questions and answers, maybe tomorrow, be happy to go into. 
But years later, he would understand this manifestation. It's one of the many manifestations, by the way, of the Kundalini, the mystic force within us, if you like. But you wouldn't expect it in a, a teenager. He had a number in his youth. He had experiences of uh, seeing a reflection of his higher chakras and so forth at a very young age, which isn't surprising considering where he came from. Um, so this really set in motion his life. He was taken out of school. He, he was looking at his own inner resources. Uh, he had another very significant, his second experience of encountering a cosmic intelligence when he was aged around 20, which was right at the beginning, either just before or at the beginning of the Second World War. And it's my impression from what I know of that experience, which isn't a tremendous amount. I know where it happened. I know it was an encounter with a cosmic being, his second, the first one at the age of 11. But what the decision that he made after it was to become a conscientious objector in the war. And that was a difficult decision for somebody of his inclinations, his character, to make. Um, but it was an essential one that he had to make because his trajectory was a spiritual one. And he did engage, by the way, in that war. He did engage in the fire service, in the London Blitz, and in very dangerous conditions, and so on. But he didn't partake in the, that war effort, which was not a very fortunate thing for someone to do in those days who wanted to be well accepted and have their career furthered. Mind you, that wasn't what he was interested in. And it was after the war uh, that he then turned to something which sounds quite normal now, but was absolutely ridiculous to people, I think, then, which was yoga. Uh, and to turn to yoga as he did, uh, this is we're talking around about 1945, he was in his mid-20s by then, uh, he had demonstrated already many psychic abilities, including, by the way, uh, in, in, as a fire section leader in the Blitz, in, in identifying bodies under rubble and so forth. But he was still on the main thing which obsessed him, which concerned him, which he focused on, which was the true meaning of life, the true realization of his inner potential. And he focused intently, I'm going to illustrate what I mean by intently, on the practice of yoga. Now, yoga now, we think of, you know, keeping fit and toning up our body and looking good. And, but yoga, uh, as you may well know, is a vast subject, the physical aspect of it being only a preliminary aspect. And he went into it at many levels. For those of you who know about yoga, Raja Yoga, Nani Yoga, uh, kundalini yoga, which I've mentioned, mantra yoga, pranayama. He went for it for eight hours a day for ten years. I think I'm, I will repeat that. For eight hours a day for ten years. I've lectured in various parts of the world. It's a privilege now to be able to include Norway on that list. I have yet to meet anyone who's even heard of anyone who's even claimed in the West to have practiced yoga, as well as doing a job, by the way. He didn't have money, he didn't have private income, he didn't live on benefits ever, he, he did jobs. So as well as that, practicing yoga for eight hours a day, on average, for ten years. I think that illustrates, that's not, that's rather alien to us, isn't it? When most people, <laughs> I think we all agree on that, uh, most people would be out looking to do other things in their twenties and early thirties, such as have a good time, meet one's future partner, etc., further one's career. No. He was focused through the path of yoga, through these advanced forms of yoga as demonstrated by yogis like uh, Vivekananda, like Swami Sivananda and others. He was out to get to the root of it, to get to the highest levels of it. He had numerous experiences, I won't go into them all, but during that period uh, he was developing as a medium, by the way, not a medium for interplanetary beings, but a medium for, uh, well, at least one of them, a very advanced Tibetan by the name of the Master Chang Fu, and a number of others, um, as the years went on, he was practicing advanced healing. Healing was a big focus for him. He demonstrated, I would say, most of the psychic abilities, outstanding clairvoyance, clairaudience. He uh, could project at will, 
He practiced physical levitation. It was witnessed on more than one occasion, and that's where the physical body at will will rise, not just the, the astral body leaving it. Uh, he experienced invisibility. He had further experiences of super strength. None of these things were his goal, mind you. These are stepping stones along the way. As Sri Patanjali says, the cities aren't the goal, the powers aren't the goal. No, they should never be the goal. The goal is truth, is wisdom, is enlightenment, and above all else is service, which one really can do. The more enlightened one is, the greater the service one can give. But that was his quest, and he found it. He found it. He was just realizing the most advanced state, known as samadhi, of the most profound meditation, the kind of meditation that can last, well, one of his meditations was to last, for example, for 72 hours. Um, and he could raise the kundalini at will. Uh, this is very rare at all in this part of the world. Um, and it's dangerous too. And I, you know, I wouldn't recommend anyone to, to go about learning kundalini yoga unless they really know what they're doing and they have the correct teaching. And I, for me, when I hear about these things, and having had the privilege to talk about these things with Dr. King on certain occasions, and listen to him talking about them, which he very rarely did on the platform, by the way. He didn't, he didn't want to talk about himself at all. He was interested in his mission, and he wasn't interested in really talking about his early life. But, um, you know, when I did have that privilege of talking to him, it was, it was quite incredible, because he had the voice of authority. He knew. He wasn't guessing. It wasn't an impression even. It was direct experience that he'd had. And this is before his mission as primary terrestrial uh, mental channel, as a communications agent for the beings from other planets. And this is the thing that prepared him. Sometimes people say, why did they pick him? They could have picked anyone. I'd like to say, well, okay, give me a list of all the people who practiced yoga in the West for eight hours a day for 10 years, and we'll, we'll tick off the candidates. The list, I'm afraid, has one name on it th that I know of, anyway, that I know of, in that period. And that's Dr. George King. And he developed these truly outstanding experiences. But to me, the thing that I, really I find incredible is how balanced he remained there he was, he did have a circle of people who did healing with him, mediumship with him in that period, and he would attend certain meetings and go to certain classes, but there was nobody at all that he knew who was experiencing the states that he was experiencing. He was alone in that respect. And yet he remained, uh, and all the years I knew him, very balanced, fantastic sense of humor. Anyone who knew him knows he had a very grounded sense of humor, feet on the ground, uh, sensible, practical, balanced, didn't go around talking about his experiences at all, much. In fact, he kept them very much to himself unless he wanted to share certain initiations with people. Um, and that's what I find quite incredible, to, to go through all that and remain such a balanced. Uh, and in his sort of persona, I noticed, and this is an opinion I'm giving you, which I think all those who knew him would agree with, he virtually seemed to me to go out of his way to adopt um, uh, um, behaviour patterns that fitted in, that conformed, that were really quite conservative with a small c. He, he didn't want to wear outlandish clothing or you know, live in an eccentric way. He, he, what, his claims were far out enough and he was very grounded, very sensible, practical, you know, got to know the way of the world. He, sometimes it surprised him. And one thing he told me when he was at school, and I have seen his school reports, by the way, so, uh, you know, I'm not just making this up. He had good school reports, but the one subject he wasn't good at at all, which he freely admitted to me, was history. And the reason he was so bad at history, he told me, is he never really believed it. Can you imagine coming to this Earth from another planet and being told the history of this planet? It seemed ridiculous to him. I don't think he believed that we were being told the whole truth either, even then, but he just couldn't really believe that a, a sort of a race of people could carry on like this through the centuries, I think. And that's just another little indication 
of, of him. Now, um, I'd like to now just touch on just some of the aspects of what he actually did um, and some of the aspects of, of Dr. George King Cosmic Avatar. Well, first of all, let's talk about Dr. George King, the medium. And just a few words about mediumship. There may be some people here who do uh, mediumship. By the way, if you're interested, we have a radio program called Ethereus Radio Live, uh, which you can get through, I think it's bodymindspirit.com. It's free. It, you can go there. We have a regular monthly program. And you can get, certainly get it through my website, richardlawrence.co.uk. And the last program we did was called, because I quite like this title, Channeling the Good, the Bad, and the Others. And channeling mediumship, uh, though some of you may practice it, some of you may know about it, it is fraught with, let's just say, the need for discrimination, the need for careful judgment. And I apply that to the Ethereum Society. I repeat that. I mean, please form your own conclusions. And Dr. King always said the same thing. Now, another thing that distinguishes us, there are certain other organizations out there that you can join them, and you don't really find out what they really believe until after you join them. That, that I think, is not very honest of any organization like that. Then the Ethereum Society, it's the opposite. You can try and join us, but you can't join us until you've got a good idea of what we believe. Uh, because we, we're not hiding this. Uh, it may be far out for a lot of people, but that doesn't mean it's untrue. That doesn't mean it's untrue. Some of the strangest claims in, have been made. I mean, the first people who spoke about electricity were regarded as out and out nutters. And nutters might be good. Sometimes people could be put to prison, or in the case of Galileo, asked to uh, what, rescind or retract his beliefs about the cosmos just because they just did not fit in at all. And yet he was right. He was completely correct. Um, it, it's, it's the way of the world. There was someone even before him, I think it was called Aristarchus of Samos, who had said a similar thing, and he was ignored and dismissed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Just because one's saying something, and I apply this not just to the Ethereum Society, and by the way, let me say this very clearly, we're not saying at all we're the only people in touch with beings from other planets. Of course not. This is something which has happened through history, uh, and this is something which has happened in recent history. Uh, it's um, something which goes on. And uh, if you're familiar with that, as I'm sure a lot of you are, then you will know for sure that just because something might seem strange doesn't make it untrue. It might make it very, very, very true indeed. Um, and this is certainly true in the field of mediumship, channeling the good, the bad, and the others. But a lot of things can go wrong with mediumship. And on this program, Ethereum Radio Live, the most recent one, is a broadcast on, on this. That's why I mention it, channeling the good, the bad, and the others. It's a vast subject. But let me just tap on two key points about mediumship. By the way, I practice at a much, much more lowly level, uh, and a very terrestrial level, mediumship myself. And I'm very aware myself of the pitfalls, and I'm extremely impressed by someone who can be accurate. Because to be accurate, you've got to have a high degree of concentration. It's not something, I'm afraid, you can just go on a weekend workshop and come out channeling the Master Kutumi, or a being from Sirius. I'm sorry if that doesn't go down well with some people, but that is my firm belief. And it was Dr. King's firm belief. And the key thing, there are two key points I'd just like to make about it. One, that the medium, while they are channeling, or while they are receiving a communication from another source, must be in a similar state of consciousness to the being they are channeling. That's by being in rapport. You can't be in rapport with someone or something which is on a totally different frequency level from yourself. And that is quite something to be. So, it means that if you are channeling a master, a true spiritual master, let me just say this, a master can be male, can be female, and the beings that came from other planets, although for the reasons of their missions, and probably, in my opinion, because the backward state of the Earth, 
um, and, the, and the total emphasis on the male gender, wrongly, uh, were required often to take male physical bodies, not always, that doesn't mean they were male intelligences in the planet they came from. They might have been both, male and female, or more. That's just a fact I throw in. And likewise, the word master, including in the spiritual hierarchy, is not restricted to men, men and women. But to channel a master from this earth or beyond, while channeling that master, you would have to be in a state of rapport. You would have to be in a state of consciousness which is compatible with that master, which means, essentially, you'd have to be capable of um, a high degree of samadhi meditation, if you're fami familiar with the term samadhi from the Sanskrit, a very advanced, if you like, condition. Uh, I'm afraid that that's just one thing. And so all those years, those eight hours a day for ten years that I've spoken, or, or, although he didn't know it then, uh, paid off because he could raise his consciousness, he could enter samadhi, he could channel masters from this world and beyond. So that's the first point I'd like to make, the state of rapport. And the second point I'd like to make is the accuracy. You could be, uh, and they are linked, the two things are linked because they relate to the spiritual development of the medium themselves, the channeler, if you like, themselves. You could be um, very advanced, you could be capable um, of, of, perhaps you could be a highly spiritual person, and therefore capable of being... Um, vibrationally uh, overshadowed by an advanced being, I would like to say that sometimes if you're, if you're overshadowed by uh, a more advanced being perhaps than yourself, it becomes more difficult to concentrate on what the message is. This is a science, this isn't a vague thing, you just sit there and you just do it. Or if you do sit there and you just do it, you're going to make, I'm sorry, in my opinion, you're going to make mistakes sooner or later without training, because to be accurate, you've got to have very intense powers of concentration in order to hold to the line, if you like, depending what method you're using. So there's just a couple of points there, the accuracy, the state of consciousness, both of which Dr. King, because of his yoga training, his Raja yoga training, his Nani yoga training, his Kundalini yoga training, uh, was able to do. I would say he became a pluperfect medium. Uh, and he was able to bring through, and tomorrow I'm going to play, in fact later today we're going to play you an example of him channeling a being from another planet in a BBC television studio. Very dangerous thing to do. We'll, we'll end the lecture with that. But also tomorrow I've got more examples. And he could, he could receive a communication from a being, and then over 20 years later receive a communication from that same being, and the voice would be the same. He'd be overshadowed, it would be communicated through his larynx. And um, he, I, I, you know, he was, a, as I told you, a very humorous individual. Uh, indeed, he could have you in fits of laughter. He had a great sense of humor. I don't think he'd claim to be you know, a fantastic mimic. He put on voices like people do when they tell jokes. But when he was channeling, it was plu perfect to the very, very last degree, the sound, the, the same, you'd recognize the voice, and sometimes there'd be an overlap between voices, so fast were they coming. Uh, it was an outstanding demonstration of mediumship, which I, I recommend you to look into, and I say we're going to play an example today, and we're going to play some more tomorrow. So that's Dr. George King, the medium. But I'd like to also talk about Dr. George King, the teacher, because he threw his own light upon the wisdom that he received. I'm going to pick out just two, the main two, I'd say, of the teaching and practical communications he received. One, the 12 blessings channeled by the Master Jesus. And those of you who wish to join us, we hope you will tonight. We're going to do a world service, uh, for, for, for world peace, I should say, service, based on the 12 blessings as a practice as well as a teaching. I know there are people in this audience who live here in Norway who practice the 12 blessings regularly. Uh, that's channeled by the Master Jesus. And the other is the Nine Freedoms, also channeled, playing an excerpt from that tomorrow. Uh, and the voice is very different, the communicator is very different, and yet 
uh, absolute uh, conformity between the timeless truths that they bring in those two teachings, the Twelve Blessings and the Nine Freedoms. But as well as being the medium for these, he threw light upon them as a teacher in his own right. And he brought to bear, I feel, outstanding teaching. I'd like to give you some examples of these. He taught that we can all manipulate our own karmic patterns uh, ourselves. And he talked about karma as being pressure. Now sometimes people have experiences and sometimes the unpleasant experiences that we have can be the most valuable to us. Uh, and I mean, I know of cases where um, there have been people who have, um, you know, had very difficult experiences, including difficult health experiences, and yet have said that as a result of those, they found their path, they found their way, they found their true purpose in life sometimes, and it kind of changed their life sometimes. Um, and that may have happened to you to, to one degree or another. And sometimes you won't know why, unless you really know your past lives, and I mean really know your past lives, not guess at them or have some fleeting thing and then put two and two together and make nine. You know, you notice how many people uh, were, you know, the Queen of Sheba, let us say, and not many were sort of carrying her coach or something or helping her or, you know. It's, it, we're always, we, we might get an experience from a past life of a period of time. It doesn't mean we were at the center of it ourselves. Um, we might have just lived at that time. Um, so, and also it can be the imagination. So this is another case where one has to really be careful. It can happen, it's happened to me. It can happen, of course it can, the memory of past life. But it again requires intense concentration and the discrimination and real care not to be carried away with imagination. But what we don't need to remember to experience the pressure that karma can bring, to bring us towards the, the path, the line we're meant to be on. And I think it's, it's a teaching that he taught and it's a, a fantastic teaching. Uh, he taught dynamic prayer. We're going to be doing that later on. Uh, we do it when we do the 12 blessings. And we, every time we do the 12 blessings, uh, in the Aetherius Society anyway, we use dynamic prayer. But we must remember that that was taught to us by Dr. George King. It wasn't taught to us by the Master Jesus who delivered the 12 blessings. We were told by Dr. King from his own wisdom, his own knowledge, as a teacher, as a master, in his own right, we were taught how to do the 12 blessings. Uh, the Master Jesus gave us the teaching. Um, the Master Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount as well, although unfortunately that's not accurately recorded, I believe. When you have something that's tape recorded, uh, kept accurately, which is a cosmic extension to the Sermon on the Mount, like the Twelve Blessings, and you have accuracy, you're very, very fortunate indeed, and obviously it's for you to form your own conclusions on that. I recommend it to you. I strongly recommend it to you. We do it online. We do it online every weekend. A Twelve Blessings uh, website, which you can log on to and join in. You can join in from Norway with people in all various parts of the world at the same time doing the Twelve Blessings. You'll be guided as to how to do it. Alison's one of the people who runs those services online. Every weekend, all the details are available to you. He taught Dr. King, and this is his own teaching, as a teacher in his own right, about the spiritual energy crisis. He said there's only one crisis on Earth. There aren't two. It's the spiritual energy crisis. And if we solve that, he said, all the other crises will be solved. You know, and if we look around the world, uh, we, we've tried various things, haven't we? In politics has failed, has it not? Uh, the finances of the world have not been more fairly distributed. As a matter of fact, they're getting less fairly distributed. They haven't, finance hasn't solved the world's problems, hasn't removed poverty, hasn't stopped wars. Politics, material solutions haven't worked even very well-intentioned ones. Let's think about the most well-intentioned and successful one, or one of them anyway, must have been, for example, the abolition of slavery, which is fantastic achievement, especially by the people who did it, who were regarded, by the way, as being something close to mad. We tend to forget that because it's so uh, normal now. 
so obvious now to any decent person. It certainly wasn't then. It was regarded as dangerous uh, and uh, a bit mad. People throwing away their careers on something as ridiculous as this. Where have we heard that kind of talk before? But even something like that hasn't stopped slavery, has it? There is still slavery of various kinds now. But the spiritual energy output will, can, does, and we can all engage in it. We can engage in it online. With the 12 blessing service, we can engage it on our own. We can send out spiritual energy and it will make a difference. Because if the energy in the world changes, it must reflect through the thoughts. It must reflect through the, the hearts. And if people change, these problems are solved. We've seen peace treaties. Let's go through the Middle East. Let's go back 3,000 years in that region. At the times there have been settlements, political settlements, and they haven't lasted. But if the people in, the, just taking just one example, if the people there change, which love energy, let's call it that, can bring, if it will be accepted, that will stop it. They won't want to break a peace treaty then, because they won't want it. On either side, on any side. Spiritual energy can do that. And Dr. King talked, and I'm giving you more examples of his own teachings in his own right as a cosmic avatar, something he didn't stress in my humble, humble opinion, Dr. King, if I may say this enough, because of your humility. He talked about true spiritual ecology. True spiritual ecology. And true spiritual ecology doesn't start with, let's save the planet for our future generations, for our children and our grandchildren. No. True spiritual ecology starts with the Mother Earth. What shall we do for her, this being, this female intelligence, the greatest beings we will ever physically touch? The greatest being. And let's put her, the Mother Earth, at the centre of ecology, not as an afterthought. And he taught us how to do this, and he gave us missions to perform, in one case which he devised himself personally, and at least actually more than one case, uh, for her. And that was, I would say, his greatest of all motivations, even above his love for humanity as a whole, was his love for the planet, the Mother Earth, upon which we lived. And this is long before ecology became fashionable. I'm going back to the 1960s. Uh, I'm going back to dedicating a mission to ecology in, in the early 1970s. And I mentioned there that he devised missions. So the next category I'd like to come on to about Dr. King is Dr. George King, the scientist. Not the physical scientist as we know it, although he was a very practical, hands-on person who was very familiar with mechanical things, with electrical things, with practical things. He made a point of it, by the way. He didn't believe in just being sort of out in a spiritual world doing a spiritual thing. He believed in being grounded. He learned skills. He learned physical skills. If a, if a journal, which he edited, called Cosmic Voice, was being printed, he physically himself checked the printing of every page. If it's 10 or 11 o'clock at night, I've been with him, he would do it if it was coming off the printing presses at that time. He was very grounded, very focused, and very uh, practical, but he believed in combining science and religion. He didn't see them as in any way different. I know that would upset the, some orthodox people on both sides. And let's not run away with all the, all the idea that all the dogma and all the cultism uh, all comes on the religious side, because there are people on the scientific side who are extremely dogmatic, extremely intolerant as well. And as far as Dr. King was concerned, it's all one. And he devised physical apparatus to do physical things. One thing was to do with a spacecraft, which uh, my wife Alison has spoken about in her a lecture which we do have on our, stand, our address, I should say, the spaceships are coming, um, which is the existence in our skies of a craft called satellite number three. Now this is a spacecraft which doesn't come to be viewed, doesn't come to end up in some classified file in the Pentagon and then be lied about. It comes, or even, let's be positive, to be shown on YouTube as a beautiful sighting like one was two or three days ago, I notice, in England, uh, sorry, in, no, not in England, in Colorado, some wonderful footage 
goes on, you know, people can say they don't exist, but they can't stop them coming. And they do keep on coming, and they do keep on now being filmed and photographed and so on. But this craft did not come to be filmed or photographed. It comes for a higher purpose, which is to radiate spiritual energy to the world. And Dr. King devised physical apparatus which is used, which has been used this very day, and will be used uh, in various countries, in New Zealand, in America, in, in England, to send out energy to the world from this spacecraft. And this is a and not only a spiritual function, it's a karmic function. Because the whole root of the problems on Earth is the karmic problems upon Earth. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't need, you know, it's a wonderful event, and all power to you for arranging it, and likewise other events that we arrange and others arrange, we wouldn't need to be doing that because they could come openly among us and land openly among us and prove themselves to everybody and force people virtually to change. But that would be against the karmic law. They won't force people to change. And that's why. That's why it's done in this gentle, spiritual manner, matter, manner. Revelations here, revelations going back to the ancient Hindu scripts, which some believe are hundreds of thousands of years old, by the way. Not 5,000 years, they've passed down orally for many generations, there are different beliefs on that. Um, but certainly, satellite number three is beaming out energy, and we can all tune in with it, and when we do, will potentize our actions. But Dr. King devised physical apparatus, and he devised physical apparatus for another mission, which we call Operation Prayer Power. He devised it for an ecological mission, which we call Operation Sunbeam. And he even devised a concept which is being used by masters on, from this earth. It's wonderful to know there are masters on this earth. Uh, they lived and, op and operated very much in, in secret. And I was interested in Terry's words, words about secrecy. And there's been another form of secrecy through the centuries, through the millennia actually, which is that revelations uh, of a high spiritual caliber were deliberately kept secret and away from people who would abuse them, for people perhaps who weren't ready to receive them. And I must say that Dr. King... Uh, broke that and has started to make revelations. He isn't the only one, by the way. That trend had already started with wisdom coming from the east to the west. Uh, I mentioned Vivekananda. One could also mention Paramahansa Yogananda. We can mention a number. Theosophy. A uh, movement had begun, but Dr. King took it much further, revealed things about the spiritual hierarchy of Earth that was known as the Great White Brotherhood, although many of them aren't white or male. But however, it was known as that. Uh, he revealed things uh, about the, the true nature of the initiation of ascension. What is it like? He observed it. He revealed it. He revealed things about his meetings with beings, three great beings, who are on earth, not for humanity, directly anyway, they are very much indirectly, but primarily for the mother earth herself, known as the lords of the flame. He revealed details about his meetings with such beings, and he broke down. Uh, a lot of the traditional secrecy which has existed in mysticism. And he himself did that. That wasn't just his, as a medium, that was as a teacher. And certainly uh, one of the missions which he devised was for master, as being performed by these masters based on some of his concepts. I know this is sounding very far out, uh, but maybe not to you, I hope. Um, and he was, I would just say, I'd bring up another word to describe him and what he was like, this cosmic avatar called Dr. George King. He was a strategist. He was a logical person. Although he was um, someone who had tapped into his higher self, he was actually someone who'd entered um, a state which used to be called nirvana, but he called cosmic consciousness. Not the only one to do that, but very, very rarely attain. I wouldn't like to guess how many people, on this physical realm anyway, have attained that state. It might be very depressing to know. The small number. The tiny number. But anyway, he did enter that state. He came out of that state mainly because of his tremendous love for the planet. That's interesting too. Very revealing about him. But although he, he had outstanding psychic powers, he demonstrated those on many occasions. He demonstrated them 
well before I met him, but in my lifetime, in my, my lifetime, I sound like I'm, I'm all on the way out. Hopefully not. I'm here to stay, but um, hopefully, God willing. But no, he, 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 in, in the time that I knew him, in his lifetime, when, when I was with him, he revealed it. He would phone up and answer questions, for example, that we were discussing in a committee meeting in London that he had no knowledge of, and we needed an answer, and he'd phone up that moment and give that answer. Uh, he showed it in many ways. He didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about his healing. Uh, he, you know, one could be ill, and uh, I remember once I, I was not well at all, and I couldn't really help him. He wanted me to do something. I couldn't do it, and he insisted I did it, which seemed on the face of it very unfeeling and uncaring. And when I got there, he was pushing me around in a jocular manner, and it didn't seem to be much. And I, the pain I had, the excruciating migraine I had, completely went. And I thanked him very much, and he said, oh, for what? He didn't want to talk about it. He had these powers. But the, although he had them, uh, though he, and these are, those are just quite small examples, by the way. He could have cosmic clairvoyance as well. Although he had them, he relied on his logic. He believed in logic. Not the kind of logic you might find perhaps in some platonic um, text so much, as something between deep meditation and common sense, somewhere in there. He, but he applied it. And he was a strategist, and he took into account things that the average logician can't take into account or won't take into account, such as karma. And it was in doing those that he'd work out a mission. He'd work out how to achieve that mission, logically. And he'd go from point A to point B. He, he, one thing that he always did was to face the truth as it is, not as we'd like it to be, not in some fantasy world that we'd all love, but as it is, in this way, he could, he could really tackle it. Uh, he was born in the sign of Aquarius, which is a logical sign, I believe, and he was an Aquarian master for the Aquarian age, I would say. And many times, I would sit with him, and he could, he'd look at all sides of a picture, he'd work out, what, almost like a chess player, very much like a chess player, what would happen if we did that, what would happen if we did that? And it was karmic strategy for the betterment of the world, which led to some of his great missions, like the mission Operation Sunbeam, for example, where energy is sent to the Earth, uh, energy is sent to the planet by human beings. And that's not easy to do, by the way. That's a very difficult thing. It might sound easy. If we just say, I want energy to go to the Earth, it won't necessarily go to the planet. You'll go to the maybe the Devic realms. By the way, the next broadcast on Ethereum Radio Live in October, it, which Alison's doing with Chrissy Blaze, is uh, on the Devic Kingdom. That's a fascinating topic. You've got to have a, a lot of knowledge, metaphysical knowledge, to be able to apply that kind of logic. But he he didn't do it. The sending of energy to to, to the Earth just because the Earth needed it. Because frankly, I don't think the Earth is waiting for us. The Earth is a great living being who can interact with other planetary beings. But she is waiting for us to change. She is desperately waiting, patiently waiting for us to change. And this is a karmic manipulation for the human race to help bring about that change. That's the kind of strategist, the karmic strategist, the cosmic strategist that this great avatar was and is. And just in closing, I'd just like to say a few things about him as a person, because I talked about his personality. Tomorrow I'm going to focus on, on the communications he received, the missions he performed, and the missions, above all, that we're performing now, uh, the predictions for the future. Talk about that tomorrow. But today, let me just tell you a little bit about what he was like. You know, one thing, and this sounds very prosaic, I know, he was, always was, was a worker. Perhaps not as we think of as a worker. He was working, he was on duty, let me put it this way, 24 hours a day. On the rare occasions, and my goodness, they were very rare, and I was privileged to be with him on some of those, when he took a vacation or a break, uh, he was on call. If anything serious broke out in the world, he'd need to be notified in case some cosmic mission, some cosmic action, some spiritual action needed to be taken, as it was, for example, at the Chernobyl disaster. I'll tell you about that tomorrow. Uh, and UFOs were seen, I don't know whether you know this, over Chernobyl. 
and we published that at the time and so on. He had to be on call all the time in case of a communication. He might at any time of the day or night get a communication. And this goes from 1954 when he was first contacted all the way through to 1997 when he passed on. A week before he passed on, and he was very sick at the time, he received a communication from another planet. And he was on call, and he took it. Uh, he didn't take it in the kind of trance condition I've described to you. He, he could also take these communications telepathically, and he did. And he was, that was the one thing I'd say. In fact, even if there was a very serious development in the Ethereum Society, which had to be reported to him, he wanted it to be reported to him, even on a break. He never took a break. You couldn't apply that to any politician uh, because they don't do 43-year terms. You couldn't apply that to, I don't think, any... Well, that's, again, I think, extremely alien, very different, very different psychology. He never knocked off. He didn't believe in knocking off. He would have relaxation periods, but they were always based on the fact that he was on duty as a cosmic agent. Uh, he, as I told you earlier, he learned many skills, numerous skills, practical, physical skills, not just the spiritual skills I've mentioned, things like Henrik's doing that. He was doing, you know, one of the first people got it. He was into video in the early 70s to keep a record. He was a whole range of physical skills, which what I could go into at length. He was into that. He believed karma yoga is skill in spiritual action. The more skill you have, the better the result. He was very practical, very focused, and he believed in learning these. He was a strange mixture, as a person, I feel, of being very confident, because he knew who he was, all the time, obviously, he knew who he was, uh, he knew what he was. It wasn't sort of, a, as I said earlier, just an impression, a vague thought. He, he, he knew it, <laughs> just the, the same way that you know you're Norwegian or, or Hungarian or whatever it might be. But at the same time, he was humble. He was, I would say he was shy. In fact, I had a strange experience with him once in, in, uh, on one of these short breaks uh, in, in California, and uh, we were sitting in a beach area, and he felt that he could have done more in the media. Actually, he, he did a lot in the media, especially in the early days. Um, and I was talking to him about Moses, and I said to him, well, you know, traditionally the, the, the masters actually sent their disciples out. And I said, you look according to the Bible, and that's always an according to, of course, considering what the Bible's been through in terms of translations and modifications. But nevertheless, according to that, um, Moses had difficulty communicating, was worried about how to communicate the Ten Commandments and was told by the Lord uh, that Aaron would assist him with that, would perform that function, help to do that. And as I was talking to him, a little boy on the beach kicked a ball over to his feet. He came to his feet, and just as I said that to him, the mother shouted to the boy, who was running over to get the ball, Aaron, come and pick your ball up. Synchronicity was something very, very common in Dr. King's life. So are UFO sightings, by the way. If you were around him, you were much more likely to see a UFO sighting than, it, than if you weren't. I've noticed it a lot. Um, and, and if I had a task to perform, or if Alice and I, or a team, had to go to a particular location for a particular reason, you are far more likely to see a UFO. That's another little point I'll throw in. But he was humble. He didn't like the public eye. He knew he had to do it, and he did do it. Um, he, he knew what people said about him. It didn't worry him in one way. It didn't stop him. He just kind of almost chuckled about it. But he just wasn't his scene. He had his mission to perform, and he operated very much behind the scenes. But he didn't believe in martyrdom for martyrdom's sake. He believed in going out and fighting and trying not to win for yourself, but to win for your cause. That was very much in his blood. Uh, he was always truthful. Now, he couldn't always tell all the truth. That's a different thing. For example, he didn't reveal, because he wasn't allowed to reveal, uh, who he was or where he came from, very much at all, and certainly not much in public at all. But he, all, he always spoke the truth. He wouldn't speak anything but the truth. Uh, I've told you he lived very modestly. Uh, the, the, the apartment that he lived in, for example, in London, which he stayed in, even in his old age when he came over, was just two rooms, and his wife had a room. Uh, very modest, 
Uh, he could have had something else, by the way, he just didn't spend money on himself. Uh, he didn't, he went out sometimes, but not a lot. Uh, he, he just wasn't into that, he kept a car, his car he was still going on, it was 15 years old. He just wasn't seeking material things for himself at all. Material things, if they help the world, there's a material aspect to it which he completely recognized and found very important. That marks him out from some other uh, spiritual leaders, but not for himself. He was very compassionate. I believe myself absolutely that he took karma for people as well as the world, um, including myself and including others. This is my opinion I'm now giving because he wouldn't talk much about it. He did admit to me he took karma for the world on a particular occasion. But uh, I believe he did a lot more than that, and rarely, if any, ever spoke of it. He was very, could be very strict if you had a telling off for him, from him, which I certainly did, and others certainly did. It was done with love. It wasn't with the, the sort of vibrations that you might expect from an angry person, although he looked angry, uh, because he was concerned about you doing well, you getting things right. That was his motive. And what came over to me, anyway, was nothing other than love. And he was very generous. He was very forgiving. He was very... He himself had extremely strict moral precepts. Extremely strict moral precepts for himself. He was celibate throughout his life. He married a great, his greatest disciple at the time, and they had a celibate union, a spiritual union, and, uh, and a very successful one indeed. Um, but... He was uh, absolutely strict. I mean, he admitted that he smoked, that he drank sometimes, not to excess, but he, he didn't keep any of that secret. But he didn't have any, um, well, I would say, any kind of moral transgressions. Uh, that's what I, uh, from my observation, I was at very close quarters. He's very correct. But the point I'm going to make is if others did fall, as it were, by the wayside in their behavior, he could be extremely tolerant and extremely forgiving, more perhaps than some other masters might have been. Unless the one thing he couldn't abide was laziness. Because work was paramount. Getting things done for the world was paramount. So I hope I'm getting some impression of the sort of person he was. Let me just sum it up like this. Speaking as a friend, he was a completely unique and most wonderful man. Speaking as a disciple, he was a far greater master than I, for one, deserved. And speaking as a terrestrial, which I most certainly am, he was, I believe, one of the greatest cosmic avatars who have ever graced our planet. I recommend you to investigate Dr. George King. Tucson Tak, thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you.